for a suburb to become more vibrant and resilient, it is essential that we care for the less fortunate and foster a sense of inclusivity. VRSIT aims to effectively and constructively help people who are currently living on the streets. They do so by partnering with other social development organizations that work in the area. With the help of our field workers and through partnerships with various NGOs and shelters, such as MESS, adults and children living on the streets are being placed back with their families. Less fortunate citizens are being upskilled, people with addictions get help and the homeless are being cared for. It's been an incredible privilege to work for VR Sit, an organization with such a big heart. Good day, my name is Nicole April. Today we will be commemorating World Homeless Day. We invite you to join us in celebrating this special day in learning about the information about our homeless community, the challenges, the successes, and of course those who actively work towards eradicating homelessness in South Africa. Joining us today we have Franita Kutsen, which is the fundraiser of MES, and then we also have Elsa Martins, which is the branch manager of Cape Town of MES. So, Elsa, can you please tell us about the services that MES provides? Oh, yes, my privilege. Um, so, people like calling us not for profits. Uh, we don't like that. Mm -hmm. Simon Sinek said, You don't need to define yourself by what you are not doing. Mm -hmm. So, we love to put it out there to put it out there that we are an impact, a for impact organization. Mm -hmm. And because we are doing impact, it means uh, the solution does not lie just with MESS. Mm -hmm. it, it lies with how we work together. So MESS uh, works together with their partners and their stakeholders like the VRC, like Streetscapes, like U-Turn, mm -hmm. um, in order to eradicate homelessness. And so how do we do that? We do that through essentially three ways of, of helping. First up is the relief services, mm -hmm. then there's rehabilitation services, and then there's developmental services. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important um, that we understand that we can help in an unhelpful way, mm -hmm. and helping in a helpful way means that um, when we are serious about solving homelessness, we need to understand that we need developmental services rather than punitive services, okay. especially what is happening now within the Western Cape in terms of the new bylaw and people want to do more law enforcement. Mm -hmm. But if we don't understand how policing uh, in a developmental way can help, um, then we are going to miss the boat. Mm -hmm. The other big thing that we need to really um, start um, biting into is that we need more accommodation solutions. Mm -hmm. Just shelters, just safe spaces is not enough. Mm -hmm. We need exit accommodation solutions. We need transitional housing solutions. We need um, communal housing solutions. There's more ways and looking at accommodation solutions just in like what we have. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third very important thing is, is that we need to expand our, uh, on our job creation um, opportunities. People need jobs. If you don't have cash in hand, you cannot afford a place to stay, and that is when you end up on the street. Mm -hmm. So I think um, our invitation to, to the state, church, and business partners mm -hmm. is come and have that conversation with us. Okay. You know, because we need to work from one plan, have one developmental language in order to solve homelessness, because it can be solved. Thank you also for providing a clear picture of the services provided by MESS. So, Franita, there are a lot of people that would like to assist the homeless but don't know how to do it. Can you please tell us more about the Give Responsible campaign? Yeah, Nicole, most people don't know what to do at a robot. Mm. Well, if you're like me, like before I used to work for MESS, as you strike a panic, you're like, oh, I must give money, I must give, I don't have apples in the car, what must I do? And um, so people, there's, there's this big debate, should I give it a robot, should I not give it a robot? Mm. So what we've done with MESS is we came up with a solution. We've got little meal vouchers, okay. less and meal we... vouchers. 
And um, so what people do, they buy, buy these from, from us, which I will tell you now where to purchase it from. Okay. <laughs> um, and then at a robot, when confronted by homelessness, you just give people one of these vouchers, mm. which they can re return to us, and we give a balanced meal in return to them. Okay. And um, that also, that cuts out the drugs and the alcohol abuse, you know, self-destruction for our people on the street. So you make sure that, that they get the balanced meal instead of any of those things. Mm -hmm. And um, then a lot of people tell me, you know what, these people don't like the vouchers. And, and that's okay, mm -hmm. because you did the right thing. You, you gave responsibly because you bought that mess voucher. What they do with it, that's okay, because that money that you spent on that voucher will go for towards the people that want to be helped. Of course. And where can the public purchase these vouchers? Okay, we've got a lot of spas involved at the moment and we wish that countrywide that they would get involved now. Mm -hmm. And we've got our Belleville Spa, all the Durbanville Spas, and um, Durbanville Preparatory School, Durbanville Primary School, and then it's also at our offices okay. in Belleville, Paro, and Durbanville. And how much does these vouchers cost? 50 Rand. 50 rand for 10 vouchers so you can be confronted 10 times for 50 bucks okay and also you'll know where your money is going to at exactly the end of the day as well. exactly awesome. and then tell me is there any other ways that the community members can actually assist in giving responsibly absolutely um we've got grow teams mm -hmm. which is god restores our world and it's a, our job rehabilitation program. Okay. So these people can clean up any area you need them to clean up. So you hire them from us. It's not like you're giving a donation, you're getting a service for them. Mm. And then um, you can also give financially, especially towards our social work services, which is crucial in, in, in our field of work. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can also volunteer your time and your skills. We always need somebody to fix something. Of course. And then then um, for the schools out there, I would say give it, get involved like the Durbanville School, you know, by selling these meal vouchers and also by educating our youth. Because if we can train our youth from a young age um, how to give responsibly, this, this, this process will not continue we will stop it in its tracks by having money on the street thank you franita for providing the information about the give responsible campaign as well as elsa thank you so much for telling us what mess does and how important it is as well thank you so we can all agree that addressing homelessness is not an easy solution and we do need collaboration and partnership. Next up, I will be speaking to Vilma Pick, which is a social development manager and her two uh, field workers, which will be assisting us, Alistair Skoltz and Veronica Gedult. back as we discussed we cannot address homelessness without collaboration and partnership today we are joined by Vilma Pick which is the social development manager for VRZ hi Vilma can you please tell us what the VRZ acronym stands for and what your role in the social development department is hi Nicole lovely to be here um, the acronym is for Voortrekker Road Corridor Improvement District and um, what that means is that we work in a specific geographical area. 
which in our case is Belleville and Faro. And um, we need to deliver top-up services in terms of cleaning, safety and social development services. And the reason for that is that we have uh, members that's part of our organization. We are, of course, a non-profit organization. And all those members are property owners in our area and they pay a specific levy to us. And that levy we are using to put in these um, extra services. And so, of course, our mission is clean, safe and sustainable. Wow, that's a mouthful, Vilma. Tell me, how do you navigate between the best interest of those funders and the homeless, their rights, their dignity and, of course, the upliftment of them? Yeah, that is quite a challenge. Um, because obviously, you know, from a social perspective, we want to do what is best for our vulnerable and our homeless communities. And from the business side, they often feel that, um, you know, they, they don't really want the people there. Um, so we really have to navigate it with care. <laughs> and um, there's three things that we basically try to do. The first thing is that we have a JOC, a Joint Operations Committee, that is facilitated by myself. And with that work group, we try to get all the people around the table that is involved with the homelessness issue in our area. Whether it is law enforcement, whether it's the NGOs, whether it's the churches, we try to gather them and we try to decide together what is the most appropriate response to its homelessness. Because many times, you know, when you look at it from a law enforcement perspective, um, people will say, you know, just chase them away, get rid of them. Um, but we know from an uh, NGO and a social development perspective that that is not a long-term solution. If we do not assist our homeless people um, with the necessary services, with the necessary help that they need, um, you know, you will chase and chase and, and they will keep on coming back because they have nowhere else to go. So um, we really try to get that awareness, you know, amongst everybody around the table and make sure that there are alternatives for, for our homeless. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we have, a, uh, you know, we need to create awareness, like what we are doing here today. You need to make sure that the community and our members that they know what is the situation in terms of homelessness, why is it happening, and what is the pathways out of homelessness. Because people often feel, like I said, just chase them away, but there are many people and many business owners that really want to do something constructive and really help the people. So um, if they are there but they don't know what to do, then obviously we are losing an opportunity. So. You know, with MESS and some of our other partners like Belleville and Night Shelter, uh, or Belleville Haven actually, we have Enum Night Shelter. With them, we really try to inform people about the giving responsible um, options that we have. You know, Fanita spoke about the various um, vouchers that MESS have. Um, the Belleville Night Shelter also have um, sleeping vouchers that you can buy from them. And instead of giving cash to a homeless person, giving that voucher. So that is very important for us to make people aware that change is possible. And then, of course, we often have homeless people that's been through the process of, you know, uh, rehabilitation and, you know, believing in themselves again, and they are now ready to get employed, but now there's no jobs. Mm -hmm. So there we need our businesses to say, you know what, I might have an opportunity for this person. And one example that I can, can give you is the Safe to Park guys. They are our service providers who's running our parking areas. And they provide jobs for our people. So what happens is that our informal parking attendants that we all know very well, they are now part of a structured environment. They wear their uniforms. They earn a predictable income every month. And they can start making a living again. And that is what we really try to create, is to make people understand that the homeless people can be part of the solution. They don't need to be part of the problem only and to be seen as that. Um, and then, of course, the last thing that we do is we provide services to our homeless population or our street-based individuals. 
And we have three lovely field workers that reach out to these people on a daily basis and that offer them help, that make them aware of the help that they do. And, you know, they just love them and make them feel accepted again. And sometimes it will mean that we'll take them to a hospital or help them with an ID. Um, and they, of course, support MES on a daily basis at the various drop-in centres. And I actually brought them along today and um, I'm sure they're going to tell you a bit more of what's actually happening on the streets. Thank you, Wilma, for providing all that information and showing us that reintegration of the homelessness into society is possible. We will be joined shortly with Alice Descaltz and Veronica Schedeld, which is the field workers for VRZ. Welcome. So the next discussion will be about VRSIT, their field workers, and we've got Alistair Skoltz and Veronica Gedelt. Hi, Veronica. Hi, Alistair. So, uh, Alistair, can you tell me what Paddo and Belleville streets look like currently? Nicole, we have in the last few years, with COVID now, with the two years, seen the increase in homeless people and people ending up on the street. With the COVID um, effects having on people with uh, unemployment and also they, they lose their jobs and they also lose their homes. And um, our homeless people, um, we see they're suffering a lot with, um, with health issues and mental, mental health issues. And also they, st they struggle with um, substance abuse um, orders. And a lot of our, the impact also, we have a high rate of crime in our area. Uh, that is due to the fact that um, from the outside communities, they come in because the, the criminals, they hide. So they come hide in the CBD, that is Belleville and Perro, which automatically increases the, high, the rate of, of crime in the area. In level five lockdown, we had about seven, we counted 878 homeless people and our safe space and our shelters can accommodate 299 people. That leaves 500 people on the street whether they want help or not. So it is a, a real struggle for us. And if, if with, the, with the giving responsibly, if we can have some people helping us or people giving responsibly, it will really help us with the alternative of what to do with that other 500 people. So you say giving responsibility is a good idea and you and Veronica are the forefront workers so you are the first you know friendly face that our homeless and our destitute people receive. So um, Veronica what I've heard many challenges that Alistair's advised among so despite these challenges are there any successes? Yes Nicole definitely um, there is successes. Mm -hmm. um, so we we found out that our street-based people really need help and they need assistance. So um, for change, there's a, a process and it and, and can take but time. But at the end, it's difficult um, to think, it's difficult to believe that change is possible when they land up on the street. So on a daily basis, we go out and we meet the people where they are. Mm. So we go out whether the person, person needs a food voucher or they need a safe space sleeping voucher. Mm. So once they set their foot in 
by the dropping center. And that is where we know that they need the help. So, um, we want to thank Miss because they opened branches at Durbanville and Paro. And in Miss, they are professionals, they are social workers, they are auxiliary social workers, they are spiritual workers, and, and there's a, um, yeah, all of that. And that professionals help our street-based people to set a foot outside homelessness. So it's sustainable interventions through the form of, you know, giving that voucher, making that contact when they automatically, when they come in, you know, that need, that basic need is then met. And from there, the process then continues. Yes, and gaining the... Um, their dignity so as well. Uplifting yes. their dignity, yes. their rights, and of course, yes. upliftment in general. Yes. Thank you so much, Veronica and Alistair, for sharing your experiences, especially because you are the you are their voice at most of the times. Because not all of us know what difficulties, not just homeless but vulnerable yes. um, individuals, yes. have at this moment in this very difficult time. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Nicole. So next up, we will be having we'll be looking at some video clips of our of individuals that received services at MESS at the drop-in centre at Paddo. I myself personally have volunteered at one of at the MESS drop-in centre in my internship, in my fourth year, in my studies to becoming a social worker. And I have seen what proper informed trauma counselling and psychosocial support really means to homeless and vulnerable individuals who have lost everything due to unpredictable circumstances. We will be discussing these trauma counselling with the social worker Gertrude April that will be joining us next. Uh, hi, I'm Claudia. I'm a community member of Peril. I just want to share my journey with Miss. I lost my loved one. And after my big loss, I went through a difficult and painful time. But through God's grace, he carried me and my 12th year daughter through the sadness time. One morning, I was very emotional. I decided to walk through Peru Station Road. I passed Miss, and immediately I make a U-turn and went pop in there. I was greeted by the student social worker, Nicole, she advised me to the center social worker, Gertrude. Gertrude and Nicole was listening to my story and they decided I need counseling sessions. And means I suspect it was and it's still worth it. I'm, I'm so grateful to have these two social workers in my life. It's not about, they was there for me since day one. It's not about vouchers, food parcels. It's a emotional support they give me. And after that, I became a better person and a stronger person for my 12 years daughter. And then today I'm a volunteer at MESS every day. I just want to thank you, thank for MESS for the opportunity they gave me. And for now I'm a proud mother. Thank you very much, MESS. Hi, I am Jainsi from Peru MESS. And I would like to share my journey what mess. I was working, but retrains due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I lose my work. And I was very stressed and ended up on the street. I was so emotional and very stressed and one morning i walking i walking to towards Perro as a friend told me about 
mess. And I was so ashamed when I passed there, I, I stopped there and, and a friendly work, uh, worker of mess come to me and accommodate me and, and they assess me and from that day I was taken in by a mess and a friendly social worker named Gertie completed an intake form and referred me to, to grow. This is the job rehabilitation program. And as the time passed by, I was working for little money, but I was very happy that they can put something on the table for my family. And so I saved from that money and I'm able to, to rent a, a small room and to put my, to put my family back in a, in a place. And I'm very happy and for mess and the staff who are helping me and I'm still participating in the GROW program and working from day to day. I'm very proud and thanks for MESS. Thank you very much. Wow, I think that we can all agree that these stories shared from the MESS beneficiaries, it shows us that there is hope for homelessness, even though the past may not look how you see it, but and different from how the homeless might need it. Today, I will be introducing Gertrude Busman. She is the social worker, as well as the manager at the drop-in centre at Pedro. Gertrude, hi. Uh, hi, Nicole. Tell us, uh, do you think that there is a one-size-fits-all solution to, you know, the homelessness and the vulnerable population? Nicole, as you've been with us for this past year, you can actually see yourself that there is no one-size-fits-all, especially when it comes to our clients. And that is why with all the social relief and services that we offer, that is also the trauma that the people experience. And that is why I want to share with you today, what is trauma and why are we to fix a person? Mm -hmm. And that is some of the reasons why most of our people land up on the street. Thank you so much. As I've mentioned to Nicole earlier, that I will be taking you through the trauma on a PowerPoint presentation what trauma is and how it affects a person, not only our clients, but each individual. So trauma is when one is exposed to deeply disturbing or distressing event, to an actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence. The actual or the perceived threat of danger overwhelms one's usual coping ability. Therefore, trauma contains three common elements, which is it is unexpected, the person is unprepared, and there was nothing the person can do about to stop the situation. And therefore, trauma can be placed in four broad categories, which is a single trauma, which is one sudden unexpected incident, a multiple trauma, which is when more than one traumatic incident occurs in a short space time. Then we have a continuous trauma. This is when People are exposed to ongoing trauma, and this also involves living with constant threat or danger and violence. The last but not the least is complex trauma, which is prolonged, it is repeated, traumatic event that is taking place. There is usually a relationship between the victim and the person who inflicts this trauma, and the victim may be dependent on the perpetrator, and therefore, the person will experience a complex trauma. I want to take you through the brain and what trauma does to the brain or how this have an effect on you as a person. You will see I have the amyg 
Dala Day, I have the Hippocampus Day, I have the Thalamus Day and the Prefrontal Cortex. So when you look at the amygdala, he evaluates sensory information. He's like the computer in the alarm system of your brain. Either you run away or dive for cover, which we call the flight motion. Either you fend off or you fight. Or you go numb and you freeze. That is when you go through a traumatic experience. That is, is what is happening in your brain at the amygdala at that point and moment. Another structure is the hippocampus. This is important for managing, remembering and recovering from trauma. It registers and informs the cortex about the time, context of the event. It marks the memory of each event with the beginning, middle and an end. Take special note of the last step that I mentioned, the sequencing, the recording that an event has ended. Trauma is the result of the hippocampus that was unable or not able to mark the end of the trauma. It never tells the cortex that the trauma is ended. As you can see there, the cortex is at the bottom. That is the cortex there by the green and that is the hippocampus there by the blue. So if the hippocampus don't inform the cortex that this episode that happened to the person has ended, that is when the person goes into trauma. So, when the hippocampus is able to recognize and tell the cortex that the traumatic event has concluded, then the cortex can instruct the amygdala that the traumatic event is over. Once informed, the amygdala can hold its alarm response, telling the body that there is no further need for hyperviolation or flight or fight or freeze. And that is in most cases when the person will be recovering from the trauma due to the fact that the person has support from other outside, like friends, family, and those types of things. So when you look at it, there's two pathways from processing. It's the amygdala and it is the hippocampus. Because the amygdala is the one that registers, it's the computer, it's the alarm system. So anything that happens, it registers, it tells the brain that something has happened to this person's body and the body becomes defensive, your heart rate goes up and that is, what is, that is where that is coming from, through the body. After those happenings and the person is in that fear, that fight, that freeze, we call it the phases of trauma. You will have your first 72 hours when an impact has happened. And as you can see, it only can last for a few seconds, but it can also last for several days. The person may be in shock, confused, irrational, and as you know, there's many more other emotions that the person can have. Or the person may show emotions or be completely calm. At that point in time, the person feels temporarily helpless and the person is depending on others. Then we have the recoil phase. This is when the person is actually, this is now happening after 72 hours. Ne? When the person now realizes that um, the traumatic event has happened, the person can express themselves emotionally, like they will be sad, they will be angry, they will feel guilty, or they will feel like, very overwhelming and that is also where post-traumatic stress symptoms can be visible. At this point in stage, the person may be willing to talk to you as a counsellor, as a social worker, but you mustn't, because we're all not the same, it doesn't always go into that sequence, but that is the phases that the person goes through when they are or go through a traumatic event. And at last, that is now weeks or months after this whole trauma that the person has been through. The person now is learning to live with the trauma or the memory of the trauma. The person is able to re return to the level of functioning. 
which will be the person is able to go back to work if they were working or whatever they were doing before this traumatic event has happened in their lives. And the person is also able to experience self as intact and a whole again. So the person will feel like I'm my old self again is the normal words that any client or any person will use. And the, and the person will be able to draw new strengths and insight from experiences. So after all of those that happened to you, after the, the incident, after the trauma is, um, phases, the person will have responses. So each and every one of us, res responses are different. And some people recover sooner than others, as I said earlier, because some of us have more support systems in place. And when we don't have support systems in place, especially when it comes to our clients, that is why it takes much, much longer for them to recover from a setback and other additional traumas. Because um, there is nobody that, can, they, that they can be dependent on. That is why they mostly end up on the street as well. And the trauma affects us all differently, as I said earlier, but also it affects us in a physical manner, it affects us in a psychological manner, and it also affects us in an emotionally manner. When we look at the physical responses that can happen to a person, there will always be a change in your sleeping patterns. It's either hyperactive or you're underactive. Or you will have a loss of sexual drive, which means you will don't have time for your wife or your wife don't have time for you, depending who's the person that is the victim or was the traumatic experience been through. Or the person will have this numbing whereby they they tossing and turning the whole night on the bed and they feel they want to feel something, but they not feeling anything. Also, when somebody experience physical responses, they say heavy tiredness in them. They sleep maybe well, but they always tired. Or when they wake up in the morning, they still tired and they sleep maybe 10 hours. There can also be an increase in desire for sex, especially when the person's been through a sexual trauma event. Sometimes it's the loss of sexual drive, and sometimes it can even be the increase in desire for sex. There can always be a time when somebody is always nauseous, but they don't know why it is. It's because they didn't deal or properly deal with what they have been having inside or all the emotions that is going through them. When we look at back aches that the person can have, especially body aches, when we look at the stomach, this is especially when it comes to children. Children have this tendency whereby they will have stomach aches due to what happened to them and they didn't talk about it yet. And normally the mother or the father of their child or the person that is looking after their child will say, um, but what did you eat? And sometimes it's not what did you eat, it's something that happened. Now this child has this pain that is going through their stomach the whole time. As I've also mentioned, there is a psychological response that happens. People have violent fantasies whereby they see themselves going to hurt the person that hurt them or they want to hurt the person that hurts them. They blame other people. They have flashbacks of the event that happened to them. And that is also when they lose trust in other people. They don't trust easily. They don't know who to trust. So they just decide to not trust anybody. Depression is also one of the psychological responses that we get when, we, when a person goes through trauma because the person can fall into a deep depression. The person can have anxiety. Most of the times people have a negative view about the world and they have recurring and de-stressing dreams. When they do have the recurring and de-stressing dreams, it's the same as nightmares. They can't sleep at night. And that is why it's so distressing on them. Because in the morning when they have to get up, they're very tired. People also have a notion whereby they blame themselves for what happened, especially with rape victims. Um, they feel if they didn't wear something, or they, if they were not at the place where they were when the incident happened, um, this wouldn't have happened to them. 
And also they then try to isolate themselves from others because they feel like I rather need to stay at home than to go out in the world. And that is also when they have a negative view about their own life. And then the recurring and distressing memories of that ongoing event that happened is playing down in the head. When we look at the emotional responses that people also go through, it is people have fear, and then there's times that people are very irritated also. They don't want to listen to an, or be part of an argument or even from a, of a dialogue because they just feel irritated about anything and everything. They feel guilty. The most times when people feel guilty is when people commit suicides because they don't know why the person try or kill themselves or try to kill themselves. And then as a parent or as a spouse or as a partner, that person are carrying the guilt the whole time with them. Emotional numbing is when somebody don't show any emotion. They, they took almost like they took the emotions away and it's just like they have this flat um, face that is, they, they show or that they will show you the whole time. So they will be happy, but you don't see the person is happy. They will be sad, but you don't see the person is sad. And that is what emotional numbing is. And sometimes they feel different about others. And the, why they feel different about others is actually because they are scared because they don't know if they can trust this person and a lot of other things as well. There's also a time when they are angry, angry about what happened to them or to one of their significant others. And also, especially when it is in death, a traumatic bereavement, people feel anger towards God, but because they don't know who else to feel angry towards. When people feel or have a feeling of helplessness, they normally have anxiety as well. They feel that there's nothing for them. They feel that there's no one for them. And they also feel like nobody cares or they don't know where they fit into this world. So when people go through all these feelings and all these things of trauma, you must always remind them that there is help outside. You must always remind them that there is a process that we call the helping process or the healing process where somebody could be helped, especially to prevent themselves from hurting themselves, especially to prevent themselves from hurting others and also to cover themselves or to protect themselves of not falling into a deep depression. But with that, I hope and I pray that this was enough for you to have at least some more clarity on what trauma can do to a person. To all and every one of us, it's not only our clientele that suffers under trauma, but due to the suffering that being so severe onto them, that is why they end up on the streets. So to end off, Nicole, I would just like to let the people out there know and understand that because the person is on the street, they are experience continuous trauma, is the one that I spoke on my first slide. Because every day they're going through something, they're going through something traumatic. And because they also experience trauma in their childhood, their, adult, their young adulthood, and now in their adulthood. That is why it is continuous and they stay in survival mode. Because at the end of the day, when somebody's on the street and somebody's begging, remember the persons or the other people, as I can say it, will be, everybody's not friendly to a homeless person. And that is also traumatic to that person. And that is why it is so, so important to get that people off the street so that we can almost like, I don't want to say stabilize them, but also to help them to move forward and to go through this healing process so that they can see that there is really help out there for them. And then they can also have like, we will say a normal future, but or normal living, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gertrude. So definitely with your presentation, I can really see that it is so important um, to ensure that people or are homeless is sustained or serviced in a holistic, meaningful, so that they can have holistic, meaningful and sustainable lives.
Thank you so much. Um, so this concludes our webinar for today. I hope it has been informative and that you have really learned about the challenges that our homeless and vulnerable people do experience. Please do ask questions in the comment box below. We will answer as far as we can. And I would just like to leave you with something. You have no idea what your legacy is. Your legacy is every life you have touched. Your legacy is every person you have met who's felt that influence by you. So ensure to ask those questions at below.